Within a span of 23 years, U2's music was stolen not once, not twice, not even three or four times, but five times ahead of their major albums coming out. In today's video, we're going to explore what happened in all of those instances. This first story starts in 1981. U2 was in Oregon playing a show when a briefcase was stolen from the band. That briefcase contained lyrics that were going to be on their forthcoming album at the time, October. As a result of the stolen briefcase, Bono had to rewrite the lyrics to the album over a very short period of time, something the band members claim was a terrible recording experience. A few years later, when the band returned to Portland, Bono appealed to the audience to return that briefcase. He made a similar request in 2001 when the band played the city again. Finally, 23 years later in 2004, the briefcase was finally returned to the band. It would be a 44-year-old woman named Cindy Harris who claimed she found the briefcase in a rented house. Harris would claim she initially had no idea it was stolen, and when she finally realized it was improperly taken, she wasn't quite sure how to contact the band's management. In the spring of 1991, ahead of U2 releasing their seventh studio album, Act Tongue Baby, the band learned that the rehearsal tapes were stolen. The group was in Berlin, Germany during the recording of the record, and while it's not exactly clear how the rehearsal tapes ended up in the hands of bootleggers, there would be two theories put forward. One was that perhaps they were stolen from the band members' hotel rooms, while another is that they were stolen from the band members' cars in Dublin. The LA Times would report in 1991 that hotel mates found the tapes in the band members' hotel trash in Berlin but a spokesperson for the band would tell the paper, it's impossible to fathom the band leaving these tapes in the hotel trash. They would always be under lock and key, they'd say. The bootleg tapes originated from sessions that were done one year prior in Berlin at Hansa Studios. Either way, bootleggers around the world started selling almost three and a half hours of rehearsal tapes. There would be multiple versions of the rehearsal tapes that were on the black market, and when U2 learned about this and the mainstream press picked it up, Bono referred to the recordings as an, I quote, gobbledygook, and said he didn't understand why anybody would be interested in it. The LA Times would publish a piece in May of 1991 that proclaimed, Call it the ultimate underground album. Rock radio isn't playing it. Record stores won't sell it. The band's record company hasn't even heard of it. The LA Times would go on to report that one bootleg that was circulating at the time was titled The New U2 Rehearsals in Full Versions, with the album being sold with two discs to a jacket promising 30 new tracks including She's Gonna Blow Your House Down, Sweet Baby Jane, I Feel Free, Don't Say Goodbye, and Don't Let the Dues Get You Down. The Times would interview a fellow named Pete Howard, who was the publisher of the International CD Exchange newsletter, who was quoted as saying, what makes this almost unprecedented is that these tapes are of songs that aren't even finished yet. He would claim he received the bootleg from an anonymous subscriber going on to say, some of the songs sound close to being the final versions, but others are still instrumentals without vocal tracks. You can even hear Bono signaling the band to go into the bridge or chorus. The band's label, Island Records, would take out full-page ads in the British press, threatening lawsuits against any music shops who were caught selling the stolen tapes. The police in London and Germany would catch a few stores selling the bootlegs, resulting in fines according to the Times. The Times would also interview the general manager for Moby Disc Record Store chain in LA, who told the outlet that the retail bootleg market in LA wasn't what it used to be, and with all the media attention on the YouTube bootleg, stores would have to be out of their minds to try and sell it. This wasn't the only headache the band had to deal with during this time, as the group Negative Land put out their own release called U2 that resulted in some record stores promoting it as the next album from the Irish band, but that wasn't the case. U2 and Island Records would file a lawsuit against the group, and I've done a whole video on the story, the link is down below. U2's 1997 album Pop was the first record from the group that had to deal with internet leaks. The record was set for a March 1997 release, but in October of 1996, 30 second snippets of two songs off the album, including Wake Up Dead Man and Discotech, were leaked online. The source of the leak was said to be an advanced video that was sent to the group's label after the album was delayed to 1997. A Hungarian fan was identified as the source of the actual leak. Then two months later, in December of 1996, the entire version of Discotech leaked, and U2's label and management allowed stations to play the song to deal with the leak. The first radio station to officially play the track was 2FM in Dublin on January 7th, 1997, a week and a half after the song finally hit the internet. 
Things didn't end there though. If you guys lived in Canada, then maybe you remember the old chain A&B Sound, who started selling the record a week early, resulting in the band's label refusing to send new releases to the record chain for a short period of time. Eventually, the remainder of the tracks off the album would leak online. In December of 1999, U2 was working on their 10th studio album, All That You Can't Leave Behind. The band was in Dublin during the recording of the record, with Bono staying at the Clarence Hotel, an accommodation according to MTV that was actually owned by the band. During the making of the album, it was reported that a shoulder bag from Bono's room was reported stolen, and in that bag was a laptop and a series of notebooks. The laptop contained unfinished tracks for their forthcoming album, and the notebooks contained lyrics. The news seemed pretty dire for the band and their fans, with U2 indicating that this incident could delay their upcoming album. As a result, Bono offered a reward of 2,000 Irish pounds, which was about $2,600 US at the time, for the return of the missing bag with its contents. Within a short period of time, the bag would be returned to Bono as a Dublin man who would only give his first name, Paul, bought the computer from someone he believed to be a reputable source. He soon realized it was Bono's missing computer, which he heard about in the press, and he would return the laptop to the U2 frontman. Bono would issue a statement that read, Everything I'd written since August was on this, and I hadn't backed up any of it, so I would have really been a goner. Fortunately for the band and their fans, the incident wouldn't delay U2's upcoming album. As U2 readied the release of their 10th studio album, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, the band was in France to do a photo shoot and finish up work on the album. Bono also happens to own a house in France as well. The Guardian would report that a CD belonging to the group's guitarist The Edge had fallen into bootleggers' hands. This would happen in July of 2004, with the album due for release in November of that year. The Edge would put out a statement at the time that read, A large slice of two years of work lifted via a piece of round plastic. It doesn't seem credible, but that's what happened to us, and it was my CD. The band's record label scrambled to call a meeting to deal with the fallout and claimed the incident could cost the band upwards of 10 million pounds, with an executive putting out a statement that read, There's a crucial window period of a week or two after a band released a new album when it will make most of its money. At that point, it is crucial to have property protection, so if it's been on the internet beforehand, it will obviously disrupt the whole band, the source would say. The French police would launch an investigation into the theft, questioning people who were at the photo shoot and in the studio. The band publicly announced that if the tracks were leaked online, they would release the album immediately on iTunes. The album would end up leaking online a few weeks prior to its official release, but the band didn't immediately put out the album on iTunes. Regardless of the unfortunate incident, the album would still go on to sell 9 million copies worldwide. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, we'll see you again on Rock Roll Stories, take care.